hello there it is time for my january wrap up i would say the usual how has it come so fast but honestly january is obviously a long month and frankly looking at this pile of books it's astounding that i read them in a half of a month because some of them feel so so far away so a disclaimer that i have recently in the past year or so been doing a separate audiobook wrap up as well as my two monthly wrap ups um but i've been thinking about it and i've decided as much as all of you are lovely about enjoying my wrap-ups and everything else, I'm not really enjoying filming them. I'm only doing one video a week now, three of those in a month are all wrap-ups, so I'm not having much time to have fun or come up with creative ideas. There are some videos on the back burner that I've been wanting to make for ages, but I haven't been able to because of so many wrap-ups. So, I've decided that I'm going to do away with the audiobook wrap-up. Um, and what I'm going to do is, obviously I'm still going to be putting in the audiobooks that I listen to on Goodreads. And I'm only going to talk to you about audiobooks that really speak to me. And I will do that in my normal wrap-ups. So generally, although I'm still going to be listening to audiobooks, I'm not going to be speaking about everyone. Just because practicality. I mean if I'm really busy in a month I might stick an audiobook wrap up in there or if I read a lot of really good audiobooks but yeah generally I, I'm gonna give that a miss. So let's get straight into it. The first book I read this half of the month was See What I Have Done by Sarah Schmidt. Um, this was around a few years ago probably was it last year or the year before? Uh, because I believe it was shortlisted for the Women's Prize for Fiction. Um, admittedly I picked this up because it has orange papers and I mean that's just that's just amazing um but also because this is a story it's basically a fictional retelling of the story of Lizzie Borden which is a story that I think a lot of people have heard of um there's the famous rhyme Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her father 40 wax etc etc um Basically, this is quite a strange story in America. Um, a girl called Lizzie Borden, well, I say a girl, she was in her 30s, but she was still living with her parents. Um, and basically, while she was at home with the maid, both of her parents were murdered in a very graphic and brutal way, basically. Um, and the evidence against her was undeniable. There was just no way that she didn't kill her parents. But she was acquitted because, effectively, the court were like, a woman would not be capable of a violent crime like this. Um, there's just no, no way that a woman could commit a crime like that. So she got away with it. Um, but this story is basically, as I say, a fictional retelling of what happened on the day, told from the perspectives of Lizzie herself, Lizzie's sister, um, the maid Bridget who was in the house, and also another man who happened to be skulking around. Um, and uh, I wanted to read this because I did a dramatised version of the Lizzie Borden story at school. It's a case that really fascinated me. I feel like... Uh, it's not a reflection of Sarah Schmidt. I really don't feel like it's a reflection of her as a writer, but I feel like whoever edited this book should be shot because it's your typical debut. It makes some really glaring mistakes. For instance, the um, man who kind of skulks about, I don't know. Obviously, he must have been there in, in actual history, which is why she's put him in here. Um, but, we, but we kind of, he is a real side character. He doesn't really need to be there, if I'm honest. Um, but we also go into his whole backstory, his whole family, um, and it just, it's stuff that doesn't need to be there, and it slows the story. No. I would also say that it's just kind of bland. It's, it's quite a bland read considering the story that it's looking at and the chilling story that it is looking at. Um, I just, it just had real issues for me. I found it quite a slog. If I really sat down and got into it, I got into it, but the issues were just too glaring, sadly. Um, I would look out for Sarah Schmidt if she released something else because as I say I think the main issues that are in here are stuff that every every debut author makes. I, I make the same mistakes myself. Um, her editor should have picked up on them though and I, it just, the pace was all wrong, the focus was wrong in a lot of places I felt and yeah it, it wasn't the book that it could have been but as I say she is still an author to look out for. Would I recommend this one? Probably not. Would I recommend looking out for Sarah Schmidt in the future? Yes, I would. Then, um, me and my partner went to see The Snooker this month, which was very exciting. It was a, a, a birthday present that I gave him last summer, and it finally came around this month. But anyway, this is not a snooker-based channel. So, uh, however, on the way there, we had a four-hour coach journey there and a four-hour coach journey back, which at the time I thought was going to be so bad. However, I managed to read two books on the coach journey back, 
which was just so satisfying. And I have to say, I think the coach journey was probably my favourite part. I just loved the excuse to just sit there for four hours and read. So anyway, the two books that I finished on the journey were Deborah Levy's Things I Don't Want to Know Now and Bluettes by Maggie Nielsen. Both are short, so you know, I can't really brag about finishing two books in one journey, but I'm going to. So Deborah Levy, Things I Don't Want to Know Now. I don't actually think it's pronounced Deborah Levy. I think it's Deborah Levy, Le Le Levy, I don't know. Anyway, I'm gonna say Deborah Levy because... So this is the second of hers that I have read. I have also read um, a collection of some of her earlier works and I thought that she was an author that really interested me. So I was intrigued to pick up her memoirs, which it's this one and The Cost of Living, which is the second one, which I've actually heard more about. Uh, this is a really lovely book, I guess. It, it basically is kind of her take on the Orwell essay why I write so it looks at the things that have happened to her that have made her write why she writes why she wants to write um there's also sort of looks in there about um female creatives and the way that women who write books and things are treated um it kind of yeah it just covers a lot of stuff but it predominantly looks at her early life and her emigration from um South Africa I have to say I enjoyed this, it was fine. It hasn't particularly stuck with me, I have to be honest. Um, but one thing that really was a bugbear for me is that the writing in this book is so ludicrously large um, and there's barely any writing to a page. And there are two of them that are exactly the same um, and I didn't particularly feel that this one book stood on its own. I think I don't know whether it's a marketing ploy or whether she had anything to do with it, probably not. It was probably her marketing agency that said that she should release them in two volumes. Um, but I, I, having not read The Cost of Living and only read this one, I would say that I think they would probably work better paired together because they're both short, they both have barely any writing to the page and as I say this kind of did feel like half a story. Um, so yeah, I think they probably would have been better paired together in my personal opinion. That might change after I've read The Cost of Living, but that's kind of the way I felt after this. That said, I did enjoy it. I gave it four stars. I'm definitely going to be picking up more of her stuff in the future. Then, as I say, I also read Bluettes by Maggie Nelson. Now this, I, for some reason, this is a book that I've been looking for for about a year. Um, every time I go into a bookshop, I look for it, but I think it's quite a hard book to, so I gave up and bought it on Amazon. Um, but because of this ongoing search, I kind of had it in my head that this was gonna be a really groundbreaking, astounding book. Um, and I didn't love it. There are parts of this, don't get me wrong, that are really good. But the most part, it was just a bit flat and lacklustre for me. So this is what it looks like. It's a rumination on the colour blue in all its different forms. Um, it kind of delves into blue in terms of depression as well. And just her relationship with blue and her explorations into blue during her research for this book. Um, there are parts in here that are really good. There are parts where you can really see some skilled writing coming through and you can tell that she's a, a wordsmith. She's got a real way with words and she's a good writer. Um, but ultimately, this was just a bit boring for me. Um, I, I liked the bits where it looks at Blue in relation to her ex-lover and her personal depression. Um, but then there are large sections of this book where it's literally just facts about the colour blue, um, which doesn't interest me. I don't really want to know about the literal colour blue. Um, and there are a lot of facts in here that she's obviously picked up along the way, um, which I just felt like I was kind of skipping those bits to get to the more personal insights. I also found that this made the mistake. Um, there are some quite dirty sexual references um, and sex scenes in here which doesn't bother me at all. I'm not, you know, prudish with my reading. The more uncomfortable my reading makes me, the happier I am most of the time. But I felt like this was the kind of book that fell into the trap of using really smutty words and smutty language without much point. It was kind of just there to shock. It didn't really add anything to the story. Sometimes it didn't even seem to have a meaning. It was just like the dirtiest words that she could find. Um, yeah, I, I, it was lacklustre for me. Ultimately, I gave it three stars. It wasn't awful. This personally wasn't for me, but 
you know, you know, I'm glad I read it. I'm glad I finally experienced it. And I also finished Kate Atkinson's A God in Ruins. I'll admit this probably took me most of this half of the month. It's quite a chunk. And I find Kate Atkinson's writing, even though it's very fast paced, it's kind of really philosophically packed. So you kind of have to take your time over it. And it's quite nice to take your time over it. So this is a kind of a loose follow on from Life After Life, which I read two years ago. It follows Teddy, who is the brother of Ursula, the main character from Life After Life. Um, and it kind of, I don't think you need to have read Life After Life to read this. Um, they, though they kind of cross over in terms of the characters and some of the themes, and there are definitely moments in here when he's having conversations with Ursula, um, where it's kind of a nod to um, Life After Life. So the two books definitely stand on their own. Um, this, as I say, looks at Teddy and it looks at it's basically kind of a rumination on a life. It looks at his life, it looks at the lives of the people around him, his family, people that he's affected along the way, um, and it, it kind of follows him from childhood to death, and it it just looks basically at the impact that we have on the world, um, at the, the people that we impact have on the world. It, it's really philosophical and really deep, and yet it's really easy to read, and it's just wonderful. Um, and the whole way through, I was kind of... It did take me a long time to get through and there were times where it felt like a bit of a slog which I often find with Kate Atkinson. I think she's a really skilled writer. In fact, I would probably go as far as to say that I think she's probably one of the most skilled contemporary authors out there at the moment. Um, I think she manages to strike a perfect balance where I would say her books are literary in the themes they discuss and even the language they use. And yet I think they're so accessible and they're so fantastic and oh, I just, I would really, really rate Kate Atkinson as a writer. Um, there were points where I felt like this could have been cut down, but the very end scene, um, which I don't think it's a spoiler to say that it's the death scene because it is an entire life, um, it broke my heart. It literally broke my heart to the point where that one scene alone took this from a four to a five for me. It was kind of teetering, but that scene just took it right up there. Um, I really loved this. I think for me personally, Life After Life was a better book and it's a book that I think had more interest for me. Um, but interestingly, I, w I was listening to a podcast with Kate Atkinson not long ago and she actually said that of all her books, God in Ruins is the one that feels like it's the book that she was supposed to write. It's sort of her her favourite book of her career. It feels like the book that she was most destined to find. Um, which is really interesting because I think a lot of people kind of consider this afterlife, afterlife. Um, and it definitely deserves merit in its own right. I think it's a really fantastic book. And as I say, it's got such deep, deep themes in there um, about just what it is to live, what it is to impact people, what it is to have relationships with people and I would just highly, highly recommend an audiobook to talk to you about which is The Cows by Dorne Porter. Um, now I really was taken aback by this audiobook. So Dorno Porter used to make um, documentaries a very, very long time ago on the BBC, I think. I believe she did one about women in the workplace and I'm sure she also did one about motherhood. Um, and she's basic um, Cherry Healy. She was like the original Cherry Healy or someone like Stacey Dooley. Um, she was kind of the face of female documentaries I suppose for a while. Um, and she retired from television really young because I don't think it was actually what she wanted to be doing and she moved into writing books and this is her first adult fiction which came out in 2017 I think um, and I knew it was floating about but I was kind of skeptical to read it and when I saw it on Scribd I thought right I'm gonna just listen to it and I didn't know anything about it going into it which I think really helped but I just adored this so much so I think this is one of those cases where it's an audiobook that I really enjoyed but I wouldn't necessarily have enjoyed it as much reading it that is a disclaimer I often find that I prefer more plot heavy um I suppose accessible fiction when I'm listening um but this basically follows three women um and they're not perfect women by any means but they all have their own sort of stuff going on so like um we have cam who is a blogger um and she's kind of become the face of motherless women and we have um two other women who one of them has a child one of them really wants a child and they all have quite high paying jobs and they're all very self-sufficient women um and basically this looks at the struggles that they have um 
dealing with men in these high power workplaces also um there is a scandal with one of them where she is shamed for doing a sexual act and it kind of looks at the morality behind that and is it okay because she's a woman um how would a man be treated in a similar situation um and obviously cam i think was the most interesting character for me because she kind of <clears throat> she takes all of the ideas that sheila hetty discusses in motherhood and she puts them in really accessible terms um, it basically she talks a lot about the assumptions that people make about motherless women um, and she does it in a really lovely way because she doesn't segregate women who do want children and say that they're the enemy. She says, you know, women should be free to make that choice and women who want babies are just as valid as women who don't want babies and I just... Oh, it astounded me um, and I actually watched an interview with Dawn Porter afterwards and she was saying that um, the reason that it's called the cows is because cows are, you know, they are used to farm they're always pregnant they're expected they're basically just cattle that they're, they're used for their milk um, and you know that's not that dissimilar to women who you know when people expect them to just have babies um and it, it's just so fascinating there are po points in here um especially towards the end where it gets a bit sickly sweet everyone's happy ever after um which is not really my kind of thing um which is why i don't know that i'm particularly the prime audience for this book however it really took my breath away i couldn't stop listening to it i think as I say, it, it discusses some fantastic feminist themes in a really easy to read package and I would just I would just shove this into the hands of anyone. I think that's the good thing about this book. I think it's a good book for anyone to read. Um, and then also um, I started doing my Shakespeare challenge this month which was to read one Shakespeare play a month this year um, and I started with Hamlet. I'm going to put this down because it's really heavy. Um, I started with Hamlet and I'm kind of sceptical to do too much of a review to this because I don't know it's difficult with Shakespeare because I don't know that I'm really the best person to review him and also I think it's difficult because I've read it and obviously it's not meant to be read, it's meant to be watched so again my opinion is therefore not really fair or valid perhaps. However, I really enjoyed Hamlet actually. Um, I didn't know that much about the story of Hamlet. I think Macbeth and Hamlet have always I think in school it was either Macbeth or Hamlet and we did Macbeth which I really don't like as a play um, but I preferred Hamlet a lot there were some really beautiful sections in here I also really loved the scene in the graveyard I thought it was just darkly delicious um, really that's all I'm gonna say about it because I, I don't feel qualified to comment on Shakespeare I don't know it's weird maybe that will change as I read more of him um, I think it's that kind of thing where you can only really understand it on a base level because obviously the language is very different to what we use now so I only had a very base idea of what was going on which is why I kind of feel like I'm not qualified to give an extensive review. I gave it four stars, I'd say it's probably now my favourite Shakespeare um, but next month I'm planning to read The Tempest and I have a feeling, I have a feeling that's going to be a winner. So let me know down below what you've been reading this month and I will see you next time. Bye!